good to see all of you this morning. Apologize for those that are in the fellowship building. I think the the first problem, actually both of the issues they had uh, were my fault. I think I forgot to hit save on the on the YouTube part as I was loading everything up, so therefore it was only going through Facebook and was not going uh, through uh, uh, the YouTube. So then, then Dana didn't hear all the wonderful things I had to say about her, so, but uh, Rhonda says she did, so <laughs> she texted Rhonda, great. But, uh, but then, and then I forgot to plug the mic in. Phillips text or somebody text said the mic's not working very well, which meant it was working off of this mic. That mic was stuck behind a pew sitting on a songbook, so I got the mic plugged in. So maybe everything is, is up and going uh, as it ought to be. Um, let me just make mention, I spent some time with Sean this week, and Sean uh, uh, had intended to be here with us in the assembly this morning. Uh, but because of uh, Jimmy Wayne's uh, funeral and so many people, you know, being around, you know, Sean hadn't been around a lot of people, and then all of a sudden he is around a lot of people. So just as a just as a matter of precaution, he did have his mask on, but uh, just as a matter of precaution, he he wanted to sit out just one more week. Doesn't have any symptoms or anything of that of that nature. Uh, but uh, we look for Sean uh, to be back in the assembly uh, this coming uh, uh, this coming uh, Lord's Day, and uh, we'll have some others as well. And uh, one thing I do want to make mention that we haven't done, but probably need to do, uh, just to be mindful, of folks that are that are being cautious, is that uh, uh, we do allow, uh, we need to allow uh, folks a little bit of time after the closing uh, prayer to, if they want to get gone. And so I talked to, uh, I've talked to at least uh, one family, and uh, and they'll probably be, you know, if they're here, uh, they'll probably kind of slip out during the last song. You know, we sing one verse of a, of a closing song, and we'll give them a chance to. To uh, get clear, but uh, just want to try to we want to try to accommodate everyone as best we can, and uh, and so just to be mindful uh, mindful of them uh, in that respect. All right, today we're going to look at John chapter three, verses three through five. John chapter three, verses three through five. Actually, we'll read verses one through five, and uh, and look at the matter of what does it mean to be born again. Now, John 3 and verse 3 is obviously the most well-known text that utilizes that terminology. But it is not the only biblical text that utilizes that terminology. And, uh, and I heard some things this past week that are, were the impetus behind this particular lesson, as well as I've already announced at least one question for tonight uh, in our live Q&A, and that is, what is the water, what is the water of water and spirit in John 3, 5? Now, we will answer that question today in the morning session, but we'll examine it in greater detail tonight in regard to, in other words, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, what, did, what did the Antonicenes think of the, of, of the new birth? And when I say the Ananiasines, I mean all of those, all of those early Christian writers who lived from the close of inspiration to the beginning of the fourth century of the Nicene Council of about 323, 325. Uh, and so, uh, and so, what did you know? What did those men who lived closest to the time of the apostles, and even some of them like Clement and Polycarp, you know, what did they write concerning? The water and the new birth, and what did they write? For example, even concerning baptism, and uh, we'll examine that in a little more detail. But as we read our text, uh, I tell you, just for the sake of, of looking at the, that the term appears in some form four times, we'll read through verse number eight, where it says, "There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him." Teacher, or Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter 
the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes, and so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so I want us to note that twice in this text is found the phrase, born again. You must be born again, verse 3. Marvel not that I told you, you must be born again, verse 7. And so this is, uh, and by the way, this is perhaps one of the most misunderstood texts and misused texts in, in all of the New Testament. Uh, for example, and by the way, th this actually goes to the conclusion, but I just want to throw it out. The phrase born again Christian is a redundancy. There is no other kind of Christian. If a person has been born again, they are a Christian. If they are a Christian, they have been born again. And so there's not, there is no such thing as a born again Christian, as if to separate a born again Christian from another kind of Christian. And so the, phra the, the phraseology itself is redundant. To, to be one is to be the other. To be the other is to be the one. And so, first of all, we want to note the, 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 the terms themselves. By way of definition, two, two words, born. That's a man who's born again. The word born is exactly, it is exactly what you think it is. In other words, there's no mystery to the word born in born again in verse 3, born again in verse 5, or born of water and spirit in verse 5, born again in verse 7, and born of the spirit in verse uh, number 8. It is the word that we all understand. It means to beget, to bear, or be born. Right, and again, no mystery there. You know, when you hear that, so, for example, in, in uh, Matthew 1, so-and-so beget so-and-so, or she bear a son, or to be born, you know, uh, or, and so these are all from the same word, all right, so nothing there. But there is some, I don't want to use the word controversy because it's not the right word to use, but there is some distinction to be made with regard to the word again. The word there has Basically, two meanings, or two, it can be understood in two different ways. For example, do you have a margin note in your Bible with regard to the word again, or born again in verse in verse 3? Do you have a margin note in your Bible somewhere with regard to verse 3? Born again? Because I have one. And mine says, born from above. Born from above. All right, so the phrase born again could be understood in the sense of being born from above. Now, what do we know, what do we know that Nicodemus understood it to be? Again or above? Again, why? Because he asked the question, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus understood it as born again. In other words, another time. Now, he was right. Jesus was saying you have to be born another time. But there is a, a distinct sense in which Jesus was also saying you have to be born from above. In other words, it's not that the text means born again or born from above. It means that a man must be born again from above. Say, so look at it on your hand out there, that the, uh, uh, in letter C under number two. Both again and above are correct. A man must be born a second time and the second birth, which we would identify as again, must be divine, that is from above, in its origin. 
And so there is no, there's no controversy or conflict between the concept of being born again and being born from above. It's to be born again from above. The, the meaning is there in both senses. But then I want us to note with regard to what does it mean to be born again from the principle of how did Jesus explain it? See, Jesus said in verse 3, you have to be born again. Nicodemus says, how can a, how can a full-grown man be born again? Then Jesus explains, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, note, what is the, what is the condition in verse 3? Born again. What is the result? Enter the kingdom of God. What is the condition in verse 5? Born of water and spirit. What is the end? In other words, what is the conclusion? Enter the kingdom of God. And so with that in mind, I want you to look at number 3 and consider what we call the principle of sameness. The principle of sameness. In other words, things that are the same. Now, when different terms are used to describe an identical result, then the terms can be assumed to be referring to the same thing. Right, allow me to illustrate this. For example, if you could, if you can, well, if you wanted to fold it in half and write it on the back, or write it in this little, you can write it here in this little little blank here. You can write A plus B equals C. Just write it right there. A plus B equals C. All right now, underneath that, I want you to write A plus X equals C. A plus X equals C. Because usually, you know, when, when we talk about math, you know, we, we refer to X is always the unknown, right? You know, X is the unknown. So in this case, X is the unknown. So let's just say I have, here's A plus B equals C. Then I have A plus something else equals C. What do I automatically know? I know that B and X are the same thing, right? B and X have to be the same thing. And so as we look at, as we look at uh, uh, this particular phrase, we see an end result. And what is the end? What is the, all right, first of all, we got, let's put it this way. We have A plus B equals C. We have born plus again or anew or above equals what? Enter the kingdom of God. Is that correct? Born plus above, from above or again, equals enter the kingdom of God. That's verse 3. What do we have in verse 5? We have born plus what? Of water and spirit equals what? Enter the kingdom of God. So what do we know according to the principle of sameness? That whatever is under discussion in the word again or above in verse 3 is the same as it is in verse 5. Now, let me give you another example of this, just, just to kind of, just kind of lay the, the groundwork. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. I probably should have done this before I just gave you that, but it'll, it'll, all, it'll, as I'll say, it'll all come out in the wash. Look at Acts 2 and verse 41. After Peter preaches this gospel sermon, and with many other words, he both exhorted and testified, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were, what? Added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now go down to verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. 
Now look at Acts 5 and verse 41. And that, I mean 14. Acts 5 and verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. Now, what is the common word in all three of those verses? Added. The, common, the word that is common in all three verses is the word added. All right? Now, in verse 41, who was added? Those that were baptized. Those were the ones that were that, those were the ones that were added. Those that gladly received his word were baptized, and then they were added. So the baptized were added in verse 41. In verse 47, who's being added? The Lord added to the church who? Those that are being saved. So in verse 41, those that are added are those that are baptized. In verse 47, those that are added are those who are saved. Now, in Acts 5, 14, who's being added? Believers. Believers are being added. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there three different groups of people being added in these three texts? Or is it just one group or class of people that are being added? One, that's right. Only one. Principle of sameness. So now, let's use our principle of sameness. Those that were baptized, those that were saved, and believers are all what? They're all added, which means they're all what? They're all the same. It's all the same. You can't be a believer unless what? You've been baptized. You can't be a, you cannot be rightfully identified as a believer unless you're baptized. And you can't be saved unless you're baptized. And so the principle of sameness tells us Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47, Acts 5.14, baptized. Saved believers are all the same group of people. Now, one more thing. To what were these people being added? In Acts 2.41 it says, those that gladly received his word were, bapt uh, uh, were baptized, and what? That were added unto them. Them. Well, the them refers to, certainly has to include the apostles, and likely also the 120 that we mention or we find in the first part or the middle part of Acts chapter 1. All right. Now, to what are they added in verse number 47? Now, our, our text tells us the church. All right? Now, just bear with me for a second. The word church is not in verse 47. It's the word them. It's the word them. All of our translations have the word church in verse 47. Does anybody have a different... Anybody have anything other than added to the church in verse 47? We don't. Why? I don't know why. But all of, all of our Bibles say they were added to the church. But the text says they were added to them. To the number. To the number. I knew the ESV would probably, would probably be really close. And that's right. They're added to the number. But it's not the word for church. It's not the word we find, ecclesia. It's the number. The, it's the them. All right? Now, in Acts 5 and verse 14, who are they added to? Who are they added to? Believers were added to the Lord. Believers were added to the Lord. 
So we have, we have the baptized being added to them, we have the saved being added to the number, and we have believers being added to the Lord. What do we learn? We learn that those that were among the apostles and those that were among the number were those that were in the Lord. Now, does the Bible give us any indication that the Lord and his church are joined together? That to speak of being in Christ is the same thing as being in the church? For example, can you be in Christ without being in the church? No. Can you be in the church without being in Christ? No. And so what do we find? Again, the principle of sameness. Whatever group is in Acts 2.41... And whatever group is in Acts 2.47 is the same group that is, that is described as being in the Lord in Acts 5 and verse 14. Principle of sameness. Now this is going to help us. Now go to the right hand, go to your right hand column. We've already established, but we want to repeat. Verse 5, we're back in John 3 now, I'm sorry. We're back in John 3. Verse 5 is an explanation of verse 3. Jesus says this in verse 3, unless a man's born again. Nicodemus, what? He doesn't get it. That, would it be a fair statement to make? He didn't get it. How can this be? How can a man be born a second time? So then what do we have in verse 5? An explanation of verse 3. Jesus said a thing in verse 3. It's misunderstood in verse 4. And he explains it in verse 5. So now look. Jesus is not discussing one birth in verse 3 and two births in verse 5. And I know that because the word born is singular in verse 5. It's singular in verse 3, and it's singular in verse 5. If there are two births under consideration in verse 5, what do we need? We need multiple births, right? But what do we have? One birth in verse 5. Born of water and spirit. That's not two births. It's one, it's one birth. And it's an explanation of what it means to be born again. So whatever Jesus meant in verse 3 is the same thing that he meant when he said born of water and spirit in verse 5. Now let's look at number 5 and close it out. What does born again and born of water and spirit mean? All right, because the first thing, we want to, first thing we want to do is establish that they are the same thing. That we're not talking about two different things. So now that we've established that they are the same thing, by the way, linguistically we've shown it to be the same thing. Practically we've shown it the same thing. According to the principle of sameness, we've shown it to be the same thing. What does it mean? But right, when one is baptized in response to hearing and to obey the gospel, there are two elements. There is a medium and there is an active agent. A medium and an active agent. In this case, water is the medium and the Holy Spirit is the active agent. Water cannot wash away sins. You know, how many times do we have to say that, Derek? <laughs> we do not believe that water washes away sins. What is the only thing that washes away sins? The blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. That's the only agent, or that's the only cleansing agent, 
To wash away sins is the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The agency, the active agent, is the Holy Spirit. But the water is the medium. The water doesn't cleanse sin. The water doesn't wash away sin. That's why Peter went on to explain in verse 21 of 1 Peter 3, the like figure wherein to baptism saves us. But a word of explanation. Not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but the appeal to God for a pure conscience or a good conscience. So in this case, the medium is water and the active agent is the Holy Spirit. Now, question, let her see. Where else can we find water and the Spirit brought together in the context of salvation? Well, there's any number of places. For example, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we won't read verses 9 and 10, which is a list of, of the sins they formerly committed. But Paul says, and such were some of you. But you were, give me a word there. You were what? Say it, Derek. Washed. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus, that is by his authority, but note the last phrase, and by the Spirit of our God. You were justified by Jesus' authority, or through Jesus' authority, but you were justified through the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the active agent in baptism. The water is simply the medium. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, and following through verse 8, and I won't spend a lot of time here this morning, I'll come back to it uh, tonight. In speaking about how we were saved, Paul said this to Titus, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. How did he do it? Through the washing of regeneration. You know what that word regeneration means? Born again. Re meaning again. Generation meaning born. Through the washing of being born again. And what? The renewing. Who's the active agent? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, verse 5. Verse 7 says, And through that means we are justified by His grace. Now letter D. By the way, next to, uh, next to 1 Corinthians 6 there, I want you to write Ephesians 5 and verse 26. Just for a way of comparison. Ephesians 5, 26. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, what, the church. How? By the washing of water by the word. Compare those, compare those two passages when you get a few moments this afternoon. Letter D. What other passages in our New Testament speak of the concept of newness? Well, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, Seeing then that you have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. You've obeyed the truth. You've purified your souls by obeying the truth, which Peter describes as being born again. In Titus 3 and verse 7, there is the washing of regeneration, new birth. 
2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? He's a new creature, a new creation. Old things passed away and all things have become what? New. Romans 6, 3 through 5. Only after baptism does one walk in newness of life. We are buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Can a person walk in newness of life before they're baptized? No. Not according to Paul. According to Paul, there is a, there is a very specific procedure. We're dead to sin. We're buried in the waters of baptism. We're raised to walk in newness of life. I watched a man baptize a young lady on Facebook this past week. Might have been a week or two ago. I think it was this last week. And I heard him say, all right, I heard him say, before she was baptized, that she was his sister in Christ. And he was ba baptizing her so that she could be raised in newness of life. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Was she, if she was already saved, was she not already in newness of life? How can you take a person who's saved and bury them and then let them walk in newness of life? Won't work, will it, Derek? It won't work. Either a person is saved before they're baptized and they're in newness of life before they're baptized or they're not saved before they're baptized and they thus cannot walk in newness of life until after they are baptized. Look, it's simple. I mean, you can look at it's simple English. It's simple math. It's simple logic. It's simple reasoning. You can't take a saved person and baptize them to walk in newness of life. That can only be done to lost people. It can only be done to lost people. And yet, they practice, they, 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 they practice, do they have any idea what they're saying? Have they given five seconds of thought to what they're saying? You may recall there was a big baptism up on the other end of town a few years ago, and they referred and they referenced Romans 6, 3, and 4, talking about how many people being baptized and raised in newness of life. And when I inquired privately about it, they affirmed that every single person they baptized was already saved. And I said, then how were they raised in newness of life? And you know what the answer was? We respect your opinion, but we disagree. So I'm not going to answer your question. I'm not going to answer your question as to how I can baptize a saved person and then walk in newness of life. Folks, let's just believe and practice what the Bible says. That, that, that's, all, you know, that's all we ask anybody to do. It's not that difficult. It's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. It's you take a dead man who's dead to sin, you bury him in water, and he's raised to walk in newness of life, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. End of discussion. End of discussion. Down to the conclusion. A person cannot be rightfully called a child of God until he or she is born of God. No one is a child of God who is not born of God. And one is not born of God until one is born again by being baptized in response to believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a very simple question. 
Have you been born again? If not, all the preparations are made. If not, I can assure you that people have been praying for you, praying for you to take that, that great step to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus and follow him into death and follow him into burial and follow him into resurrection and newness of life. To die no more, Romans chapter 6, verses 7 and following. If you're a child of God and you've turned your back on your birthright, repent of your sins. Confess your sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse from all unrighteousness, verse John 1 and verse 9. If you need to respond in any way to the call and invitation of our Lord this morning, we want you to come right now. Let's together we stand and sing this song. Jesus.